third and uh, last uh, lecture by uh, Professor Ackerman, uh, where he will speak uh, of uh, so closer to atoms and closer to his research, uh, recent uh, research topics. Uh, please. Good morning. Uh, in fact, yesterday, I told you that I will uh, present some work which is more recent on the Casimir force and with a new method to uh, describe uh, disordered systems. I must say that uh, following your questions yesterday, I uh, arrived to the conclusion that uh, perhaps uh, it's better to speak uh, about something else, which is uh, what I chose eventually. Uh, so it is not as recent research work. It is uh, more from the few years ago. <coughs> but this is closer, first of all, to uh, atomic physics. And it's a very nice, uh, I think, example of a, a quantum phase transition that looks like uh, Anderson transition and for uh, non-hermitian sy systems, which was also one of the questions that you asked. So because of for all those reasons, I uh, hesitated a bit and uh, decided to present this work instead of the other one. Uh, in fact, I hesitated from the very beginning because I sent I was uh, asked to send uh, my lectures, and I sent the two lectures, the one that I, did, I will not give, and this one, also because I was not sure uh, what to do. So eventually, today, we will talk about cooperative effects and photon localization in atomic gases, phase transition in non-emission random matrices. So this is uh, a work that has been done with uh, uh, PhD student at the Technion at that time, Ari Gero, and uh, with uh, collaborators in uh, Nice, Robin Kaiser and uh, Louis uh, Belando. And uh, so let's start. And again, it will be didactic, like, I hope. So slowly, slowly, it's early morning. Uh, so, and the uh, things that we saw already uh, yesterday and two days ago. So, what it is about, uh, it's again coherent multiple scattering of photons or waves. So, here we will talk more about photons, you will see why. And Anderson photon localization, which means phase transition, is it possible to localize photons in the sense that I described yesterday? You remember? Scaling, Anderson localization, and all this. So this is what I want to discuss. So uh, this is about the photons, about the wave. But who are the scatterers? The scatterers here will be, today, atoms. And those atoms, they could have a lead to cooperative effects and something that is called a decay superradiance. Did you hear about superradiance and cooperative effects before? Who never heard about this? All the rest you heard. So it's, uh, I will discuss this in, uh, in quite details. But uh, what I want to, uh, to show is that there is uh, basically a competition between uh, two effects. One is the, uh, Anderson the Anderson mechanism to localize photons. And the second one is the decay superradiance that wants to delocalize photons. And question, who is going to win? Okay. So the framework, the framework is that uh, uh, the scatterers today are not what we discussed uh, the last two days. They are atoms. Those atoms are two level. Those atoms are two level systems. And those, is, those levels can be uh, degenerate. They have, so there, is, there are two energies here. 
One energy omega zero is the uh, energy spacing between the two levels. The second energy scale is the width of the excited level, which is gamma. This, the width describes spontaneous emission, the coupling of the atoms to the uh, QED vacuum. Okay? Now, uh, the width can be only for the excited states. We know that the ground state cannot have a finite width. Okay? So this is the framework. And photons now are going to be uh, multiply scattered by uh, this gas of uh, two atom, uh, two level uh, cis atoms. So again, I remind you uh, what we have uh, discussed uh, earlier. For us, multiple scattering means that there are many, many scatterings uh, of the photons by those atoms. There are two characteristic lengths. One is the wavelengths of the photon. The second one is the elastic mean free pass that is given usually by this. But now, the novelty in uh, the scattering of photons by atoms is that this scattering can be resonant. And resonant scattering means that the cross-section now is proportional to the wavelength squared, okay? So which makes the elastic mean free pass much smaller because the cross-section is much larger. Okay, so the disorder strengths, you remember that we defined weak disorder by saying that the wavelength is much smaller than the elastic mean free pass. So which means that there is a parameter which is dimensionless, which controls the strength of the disorder. And this parameter is one over K0L, or if you prefer, wavelength divided by elastic mean free pass. This quantity is dimensionless, and it describes the strength of the disorder. You agree? Yes? Sure. Okay, so now uh, let's put uh, uh, all the, the things that we obtain. So the elastic mean free pass, I remind you that for atomic scattering, resonance scattering is given by this. N is the density of, uh, of uh, atoms. So this means that this is the number of atoms divided by the volume of the system. And sigma goes like lambda squared, so this is the elastic mean free pass. Okay? And now this quantity, 1 over K0L, which is lambda divided by L, and taking this into account, I can put it under that form, where this number n perp is just defined by this, K0L squared divided by 4, and this number is called the number of transverse channels. Why? For some reason. I mean, you know why? But it's not very important. It's just what remains. Okay, so this, what is important is this. This we know what it is, so what remains is another quantity, and I can define this quantity. Okay, so uh, this is the disorder strength parameter. This parameter will play a very important role. Again, it measures the strength of the disorder. If W is small, it means that the photon, they weakly scatter on the atoms. If this parameter is large, it means that the photon, they scatter a lot, okay? So, uh, in the weak disorder limit that we studied yesterday and the two days ago, this parameter is small. But now we want to explore other limits, okay? So, let me remind you what we said about uh, phase transitions, Anderson phase transitions. Uh, this result I showed you yesterday, uh, and we arrived to the conclusion that Anderson localization, which is a phase transition above two dimension, is a transition between uh, a situation where the excitations, either the electrons or the waves, are delocalized, so in that case we have a conductor, for electrons, or we have delocalized photons for waves. And another phase, which is a localized phase, in which electrons are localized, in which case we have an insulator for electrons, or uh, photons are localized, and then we have uh, I mean, localized photons. But this, as I told you, has never been observed. Okay? So this is uh, uh, what we saw yesterday. Uh, I included another uh, example because the question was raised 
uh, yesterday about uh, uh, another system where this phase transition has been uh, observed. So again, this is the phase transition. So we have scaling. This is the conductance. This is the disorder strength that I just defined. And what we saw, what we said yesterday is that this quantity is a scaling function of this ratio. And here, if you, what you see here is the phase transition point of the Anderson phase transition that occurs in three dimensions, but not in two dimensions. Now, <coughs> uh, based on ideas of uh, Fishman, Grempel, and uh, Prange uh, from uh, 1984, and Guarneri et al. from uh, 1989, there were experiments that uh, have been uh, uh, done for the kicked rotor uh, system, which is a completely different system. It's not localization in the real space. It's a localization in the momentum space. So it's a different setup. But what they measured, this is a measurement. It's not numerics. What they measured is really a phase transition that looks very much like the Anderson phase transition, OK? But here, there is no notion of dimensionality of the system, nothing. It's just a, a zero-dimensional system, OK, this kicked rotor. I don't want to enter into this, but since you raised this question, so here is, uh, is uh, a slide on this problem. So uh, um, yes? What? What is what? Kick rotor, what is a kick rotor? This is what I explained yesterday. Uh, when I kick rotor is just uh, a quantum system that at, uh, as a function of time, so it's a time dependent Hamiltonian, zero dimensional one, and you give just a series of delta function kicked. Okay, so it's uh, very strange, but it's a quantum chaotic system. And this quantum chaotic system has a phase transition which really looks like the Anderson phase transition. Again, this was a proposal of uh, those gentlemen in the, in the 1980s. Uh, Shmuel Fishman, by the way, was my colleague for many years. Uh, so, and this, this has been observed, okay? <clears throat> but again, it's a very different system. This is in that sense that I said that Anderson transition has never been observed because this is not uh, uh, spatial uh, wave uh, uh, localization of waves or of electrons. No, no, it's, uh, it's the same universality class. It is the same universality class. So in that sense, it's uh, an Anderson phase transition. But again, here you don't see any localization in real space of anything. It is in momentum space. Okay, so uh, uh, now that all this is clear, uh, let's discuss cooperative effects, superradiance and subradiance for those of you who forgot a bit about what it is. Uh, so cooper cooperative spontaneous radiation, or what is called superradiance, results from quantum phase correlations, which are induced uh, uh, by dipole-dipole interactions between uh, atoms, okay? So uh, uh, let's look at uh, a very simple problem of uh, two atoms, two two-level atoms. So this is one, this is the second one. So you have an uh, incident wave. This is the wave vector of the wave. This is the polarization vector. And in fact, those two atoms are in the ground state. I call G the ground state. So here you have two atoms. The GI is the ground state here. G, G, J is the ground state here. Good. So now, uh, out of this, you can build uh, two excited states, which are those two excited states. Uh, we, those are called Dicke states. Uh, two states in which, uh, in the first one, the first atom is in the excited state. The second one remains in the ground state and the opposite. And you can make a combination of those two uh, states, which looks very much like the triplet-singlet uh, states for spins, right? But it is not, because those three states, they have different energies, whereas for spins, they have the same energy. So it looks like triplet-singlet, but it is not. So this is an important point to notice. 
And uh, so those decay states, plus minus, are just linear combination of uh, those two states. So now that you have this, you can do, uh, uh, you can calculate, uh, so th those two atoms, they interact. And I think that even I will explain this with my hands. But I need two hands, and I cannot hand the microphone. So what can I do? I need two hands. So here you have gamma, and this gamma gives you the energy scale or the time scale after which this atom will go to the ground. Now question. I bring a second atom, which is an identical one, in the ground state. Okay? It is very, very far away. Does it influence the spontaneous emission of the first atom? Good question. Can say yes. This, uh, the fact that you can change the, the fact that you can change the rate of spontaneous emission uh, due to uh, the presence and the interaction with the second atom is called, for the case of two atoms, subradiance or superradiance. It is just a cooperative uh, effect. Cooperative means that, in fact, bringing a second atom close by will either trigger, enhance spontaneous emission or inhibit spontaneous emission, okay? So you can solve the problem, and uh, here is the solution. What you see here, <coughs> what do you see here? You see here the, uh, uh, the real part and the imaginary part, so we are interested in the imaginary part, which is the width of the levels. So now what you see, gamma is what we had before, and R is the distance between the two atoms. And K0 is the wavelength. Okay, epsilon is plus or minus one. You have two, we have two solutions. And one solution is epsilon equals one. And you see that if R is equal to zero, which means that the two atoms are extremely close one for, uh, to the other, you see that the, uh, 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 the rate of decay of spontaneous emission will be now one plus, this is also one. So it will be two gamma. And the fact that you have an enhanced rate means that you will uh, have more easily a spontaneous emission. This is called superradiance. But you have another solution, because uh, what we saw previously is that we have two decay states, plus minus. And the other solution is uh, epsilon equals to minus one. So this is this decay state. And for this case, what we get is that this is one, this is minus one, so the rate of spontaneous emission now will be one minus one, which is zero. Which means that uh, uh, the atoms will not emit its photon. This photon will stay there. Gamma is equal to zero, okay? But it's not really what happens. What happens is the following. The photon is not really localized. So 
with me that overall the system of the two atoms will not emit a photon. And this is what is written by gamma intensity here. We call this subradiance. Okay? So uh, we can have either uh, 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 enhanced uh, spontaneous emission or inhibit inhib inhibited spontaneous emission. Simple? So this is the idea. The problem is that if you want to go uh, beyond three, uh, two atoms, what is the problem? For instance, three atoms. The problem is that you don't know how to solve this problem. There is no solution. Okay? So beyond two atoms, there is no such beautiful solution, except in few limits. And uh, <coughs> before I tell you about those two limits, uh, suppose now that you have n atoms, what is known is phenomenological, so it's, there is no exact solution as I showed for two atoms. But the idea is the following, is that if we have uh, uh, n atoms without this cooperative emission, then n atoms will uh, emit their photons, and uh, the emission process for the intensity as a function of time is an exponential decrease. This exponential decrease is very well known under the name of, which name? Which name? No, you, you, you don't know? Wigner Weisskopf, you never heard about this? Never? So if we have uh, what we learn in uh, basic uh, uh, QED, I mean the theory of this width of, uh, of the energy levels is that if you have a gas of atoms, each atom will emit its photon, and this emission will give a, a probability that decreases exponentially with time. It's beyond the Fermi golden rule and all this. Okay? So this is called wigner weisskopf limit. Okay? So this is what is uh, uh, written here. So you get that the intensity, which is the probability of emission of the photon, if you prefer, decreases exponentially with the time, and uh, the emission is isotropic at all, in all directions. But and the uh, uh, intensity is proportional to the number of atoms. But now if you have spontaneous emission, what uh, is expected is something like this. You don't get an exponential decrease of the intensity, but you get a, a blur, a, a bump like this, which means that for a given characteristic time, all the atoms will uh, coherently emit their photons at once in a time scale which is uh, controlled by the width of uh, this peak, which is called tau s. Okay? So, and the emission will be strongly anisotropic, and moreover, the intensity of the emission, instead of being proportional to the number of atoms, it will be proportional to the square of the number of the atoms. So this is the, uh, the basics of, uh, of superradiance emission. But again, there is no exact solution for this, it's just numerics. The uh, person that did all this uh, work that uh, was really pioneer in this, after Dicke, was uh, uh, Serge Aroche. You heard about this name? You heard? You like him? So he did this. He's good. Good. Yes. Usually when we think in a spontaneous emission, uh, we think in a coupling of uh, the atom with modes of the vacuum, okay. which, is, which would be your interpretation of how the interaction with another atom can change this uh, uh, density of states in the golden, in Fermi's golden rule, for instance. No, the density of states of what? Of the, of the of vacuum? The vacuum? Mm -hmm. There is no change. No change at all. Just here is something that is triggered by by the atoms themselves, the interaction between them, not by the photons. The photon, the photon vacuum is the same. There is no new scale. There is one scale which is gamma. Gamma depends on the density of states of the, of the photons in the vacuum. This does not change. This remains the same. Now here, it's just the idea that 
the atoms, instead of emitting photons independently and randomly, they just speak together. This is what I showed with two atoms. They, uh, they have a protocol and they say, oh, why not to emit a uh, our photon together? You know, it would be much better. So this is, but now the fact that the quantum vacuum is here, it, it will not change. Just that the atoms, they, they decide to do it coherently, cooperatively. That's the only thing, okay? The difference between the two pictures is the proximity of the atoms. Between those two? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the difference between those two pictures, so it's precisely what I want to tell now, but uh, yes. Uh, okay, so before I said I answer to your question, I just want to say that very often in the literature, uh, it's written that if you get an emission that is proportional to the square of the number of atoms, this is called the uh, sometimes super radiance, but there is another effect which, has, which is not a quantum effect, which therefore has nothing to do with what I said, which is called superfluorescence, which has been observed, and which also gives uh, an intensity proportional to n squared, but this is completely different from what I'm talking about, because a uh, super radiance is really the mechanism that leads to a coherent phasing of the atoms. So the atoms decide coherently to emit their photons, which is not the case of superfluorescence. Now to answer your question. In order to see uh, this superradiance emission, which has never been observed, like the Anderson transition, by the way, okay, uh, there are two ways. One way is to say that the atoms are uh, very, very close one to the other, which is what we called uh, R equal to zero for the two atom case. In that case, this is called the decay limit. And in this limit, where the volume of the, uh, that contains all the atoms is of the order of the wavelength cube, which means that all the atoms, they are in fact piled one upon the other. Okay? So in this limit, the decay limit, uh, you can solve exactly the problem and you get super radiance. But this is not the picture that I showed. Okay, so in this limit, you get, in principle, this picture, but, uh, but this is not a, an achievable limit, okay? Uh, so for larger systems, where numerically we would expect something like I showed before, now there is another effect, which is a, a Anderson transition. So what is the, the issue now? Again, the issue of... Uh, uh, super radiance is that all the n atoms which are spread out in a whatever large volume, they speak together coherently, which means that they are quantum coherent, and they decide to emit their photons together. But if the atoms are distributed randomly, which is the case in the gas, then there is the phenomenon of Anderson localization. And Anderson localization in 3D we showed that there is a chance that the photons will be localized, which means that the atoms, they cannot speak together. The only a fraction of them could be able to speak together. And this fraction is what is written here. It's the number of atoms times the uh, uh, localization length that we introduced divided by L to the power D. Okay, only those atoms could speak together and decide to emit their photon together which means to be super radiant, but it is a small part of them. And uh, then we have two mechanisms that are one against the other. Uh, so if you are localized, then you cannot see super radiance, okay? And if you see super radiance, then you are not localized. So it's uh, Dicke against Anderson. They were both at Princeton. Who is going to win? So this is the, uh, what I want to discuss now, today who is going to win between super radiance and cooperative effect between the scatterers and disorder effect induced by the same scatterers that scatter the photons. So who do, do you think is going to win? Dicke or Anderson? Who is in favor of Anderson? You don't like Anderson. Who is in favor of Dicke? Uh, 
Well, uh, I think that, uh, uh, so, uh, this is what we did for many years with uh, Robin Kaiser, and uh, the, the point is that I still don't know who is going to win. I have two answers. One, one is going to win, the second, the second is going to win. So you will tell me at the end. Uh, okay, so this is this, and now, uh, so this is what I said, Anderson localization and cooperative spontaneous emission are competing effects. Okay, so let's go now and try to solve the problem. So, uh, Hamiltonians, uh, everything. So, uh, we have n identical two-level atoms, like I described at the beginning. They are located at random positions that I call Ri. The uh, distribution is uniform, the uniform density of atoms. Uh, they have electric dipole moment, di, and the quantum radiation field is E. So, the total Hamiltonian of the system has two parts. H0, which is the non-interacting Hamiltonian, so it has a part of the atoms. Those are n atoms, two-level system Hamiltonian, with one uh, energy omega zero that we defined earlier. And this is the uh, uh, Hamiltonian of the radiation, of the free radiation. Just a second. And then uh, those uh, uh, two-level atoms, they interact so the di dipole interaction, and this is the interaction between the atoms and the electromagnetic field. Okay, so this is the U, which describes the uh, interaction. And the total Hamiltonian is the sum of those two. Okay, yes. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> this is what we will try, but this is a very good question. Yes, we'll try to, to think about, to, to see the difference between the two here. Yes. Uh, the second question is related about the electric dipole Hamiltonian. Uh, why not to include the terms representing dipole-dipole interaction. There's the dipole with the field. Yeah, because the dipole, they interact through the field. Ah, okay, the field is dressed with the... the dressed, the I don't know, but the, the interaction between dipoles is because of the field. Ah, okay. So again, you will see it in a, in a second. Okay, thank okay. you. So, ah, it's very, very nice from here. I should, uh, I should stand here. So this is the, uh, the total Hamiltonian. Now, when you have something like this, what you do usually is you trace, you build an effective Hamiltonian, and this effective Hamiltonian is obtained by tracing over the uh, degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic field. And when you do this, you get an Hamiltonian that describes direct interaction between dipoles. And this Hamiltonian takes the following form. I mean, for two, level, for two atoms, it's obvious. So this Hamiltonian now is, by definition, non-hermission, because you traced over many degrees of freedom. Okay? And you see it here, for instance, this, this, uh, before we had just uh, the energy difference between the two levels. And now we see that this energy difference uh, to this, there is an imaginary part, and this imaginary part includes this new scale, gamma zero, which is the width of each uh, uh, excited uh, level. Okay? So there is this width, and moreover, in addition to this, so this is a collection of n atoms with energy difference h bar omega zero and width gamma zero. In addition to this, you have also a direct dipole-dipole interaction, so th those operators, delta i plus or minus, are dipole-dipole operators, and you see that there is an interaction, vij, that depends on the position of two dipoles, and this uh, interaction v has also a real part and an imaginary part, so this v is a complex valued, and it is random because the position of the dipoles is random. And there is only one scale that shows up here, which is this gamma zero, which is the same as here. 
Okay? You are with me? Yes? Sure? You have a question? Uh, why the interaction, uh, interaction between the dipoles need to be complex, and what will uh, the value of uh, beta and gamma be? This I will tell you in a second. Why is it complex? Why is this complex? Because of the, the spontaneous emission? Because the spontaneous emission, because that the atoms, they interact, each of them interact with the field. But now, when the atoms, they, you remember the example of the two atoms? In the two atoms, we got gamma plus and gamma minus, which was, and gamma plus and gamma minus is encoded here. It's a, an interaction between the two atoms, which has also a real part and an imaginary part. Okay, and the imaginary part gives super radiance or sub radiance when it is connected to this. So what we did for two atoms is just here a generalization to n atoms. It's exactly the same. At this level, it is exact. Okay? So, so now, what is beta and gamma? So this uh, real part, an imaginary part of this interacting potential between, uh, at between atoms, between dipoles, so the real part uh, describes an effective interaction potential between the two atoms, so it has this form. Well, we, this is very well known. It, is, uh, it, it has uh, oscillations, and it goes, there is one term that is one over r, one over r cubed, one over r squared. Okay, and P and Q depends on the polarization of the waves. It has an imaginary part that describes the uh, uh, modification of the uh, spontaneous emission rates, which has this form also. And if you look now for scalar waves, which is what I did uh, before for two atoms, uh, those two expressions uh, simplify to this. And by the way, here you recognize this uh, sync function that we had for two atoms, but this is now for n atoms, where rij is the, dis the random distance between any two atoms, i and j. Okay? So the, uh, the case of two atoms with the, the sink that we saw is because of this. So this comes to correct this part, okay? And this is super radiance and sub radiance. Okay, you're with me? This is the simple part. It will, from now, it will be much more complicated. So now uh, that we understand all this, uh, which quantity to study in order to see if we have localization or not. So now we are ge getting close to your uh, question, your remark, your remark. And one possibility is the following. Suppose that I take a cloud of atoms and I put one atom in the excited state and all the other atoms are in the ground state. And I'm interested in the following question. What is the emission rate of this cloud which means that if now I measure by uh, detection of photons that are going out of this cloud, what is the, uh, the rate of collection of the photons that are going outside? If there are no photons going outside, I could say that the photon is localized because of this order. But it may be also that it is localized because of subradiance. So how do to, to differentiate between the two? I don't know. But this is the, what we want to do. But this is the criterion that I take. I have uh, this situation. So this is the, uh, wave, the wave function of the n atoms. One uh, atom is in the excited state. I'm interested to, to know what is the distribution of photons going out, uh, uh, out of this cloud. OK, the escape rate uh, of those photons. And again, this is perhaps uh, not the transport quantity like we had in Anderson localization and uh, so on. But this is a good way to measure localization property of the photons, if they are going out or not going out. You accept it? You have no choice, but you can say, uh, you can get your opinion, give your opinion also. But. So uh, uh, then I want now to uh, look at the photon escape rates. To get the photon escape rates, this is very 
systematic. I first look at the uh, uh, density matrix evolution of this system. I remind you that this is a non-hermitian system. So this has the, the so-called Lindblad form. This is the Lindblad form. And uh, it depends on uh, gamma ij. I remind you that gamma ij is the uh, imaginary part of this potential between uh, atoms. All this is extremely well known since uh, the work of Michael Stephen in 1964 and uh, all along the years. So this is the, uh, the way to solve this problem, which means that we're interested now in photon escape rates from the atomic gas, which are obtained from the eigenvalues of the Euclidean random matrix, gamma ij. And this gamma ij, again, is the imaginary part of this potential, which is given by this for a, a, a polarized wave or this for a scalar wave. So now I will consider just this for a scalar wave. Okay? So I want this is the distribution of the emission rates. Okay? So uh, this is the scalar case, this is the, the matrix. And now I define this dimensionless quantity, K0 Rij, which is Xij. And this means that this matrix, this matrix now is just sync of this. I remind you that we have uh, different dimensionless quantities. One uh, dimensionless, dimensionless quantity will be the volume measured in units of the wavelengths. I call it A, okay? And another quantity, which is dimensionless, is the strength of the disorder, which is this uh, ratio that we defined earlier, right? Good, so now I look at the uh, eigenvalue density, P of gamma, of this matrix, gamma ij. So this matrix is an n by n matrix, n is the number of atoms, and all this gives me the emission rates of this matrix. And I look at this distribution of this, gamma ij, for different values of this order and different values of the volume. A, small a, and big W. And this is what I obtained. This is numerics. And this is P of gamma for a very weak disorder. W is 10 to the minus 3, and the volume, which is pretty big. And you see that, in fact, it is strongly picked around 1. 1 is in units. This is gamma in units of gamma 0. And what does it mean? That for very weak disorder and very dilute system, you have a collection of atoms that emit their photons, each of them, with almost the gamma zero, which means they don't see each other. So this is the Wigner-Weisskopf regime. Okay? So here, we have a collection of n atoms that are very far apart, one from the other, and each of them emitted photon when uh, it finds, uh, you know, good to do this. No correlations. So now I increase the disorder. And so this is uh, 10 to the minus 3. Now this is disorder 10 to the minus 1. And with a smaller volume. And this is the distribution P of gamma. And you see that, in fact, it is quite different from this. First of all, it is asymmetric. And it is much broader than the one that we had here. And now I increase the disorder again. And uh, for a quite strong disorder, it's two orders of magnitude larger than this one. You see that now this distribution as this form, which means it is strongly picked around gamma equal to zero. Gamma equal to zero means subradiance, means that the photon does not escape, okay? And uh, this is for very strong disorder. And if now we go to a very strong disorder, but in fact, an extremely small volume, then we get back the decay limit, and the decay limit is, uh, in fact, two peaks, one at uh, N. There are 216 atoms here, so this is 216, and one at N equal to zero. Okay? So here, no, uh, no doubt, the photons, according to the criterion that I defined, are localized. But question, they are localized because of decay, or they are localized because of Anderson? This we don't know. So if they are localized because of Anderson, we are in 3D, we should see a phase transition between the delocalized limit and the localized limit. 
if they are localized because of decay, there is no reason to see a phase transition. You are, uh, you see, it's it's really it's it's very tense here. Okay, we don't know the answer. Okay, so the and this is the question. We we see localized photons, but we don't know why they are localized. Okay, so in order to see if there is uh, uh, localization, as we saw uh, earlier, what we try to do is to see if there is scaling. Is it possible to characterize this distribution using a scaling function that depends on volume and disorder, such that we could put it under a scaling form? If there is such a scaling form, then we can try to answer if there is phase transition or not phase transition. Okay, so uh, we found a, a scaling parameter, so I will show you why it is a scaling parameter. And this uh, parameter here, it describes the relative number of localized states, meaning the number of states which have a vanishing escape rate. Okay, so this is defined using this uh, function P of gamma that we uh, just uh, is, uh, looked at by this integral. This function is defined between 0 and 1, by definition, okay? And uh, we expect it to have a scaling form, which means that it's not a function of the volume and of the disorder, but it's a, but it's a function of only one variable, which is a volume divided by a function of disorder. If we don't have scaling, then there is absolutely no answer to uh, localization or, uh, or uh, cooperative effects. So this is a necessary condition to be able to answer the question of transition or not. So this function, uh, let's see if it scales. So this is the function for different values of this order from uh, 5, 10 to the minus 2 to 200. So you see there is a, a cloud of points. And if there is scaling, it means that if now I plot this function not as a function of A, but as a function of A divided by a, a good function of psi, which depends on this order, then I should be able to put all those points on the same curve. And this is the result. Okay? You can put all those points along the same curve if now you choose this function, A times 2 pi A times W. Okay? And A times W is just n divided by n pair that we defined earlier. And then you can put all those points on the same curve. So this is good. First of all, it's beautiful. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes. I also think that it's beautiful. A is the volume in units of, uh, of the wavelengths. Okay, so all those parameters are dimensionless. A is volume in, in units of uh, wavelengths, and W is the strength of the disorder, which is one uh, lamb, uh, wavelength divided by elastic mean free pass. <clears throat> so you see that uh, this is scaling. And now, if this C is close to 1, according to the definition of C, it means that photons are localized. They do not escape. If C is close to 0, it means that photons are delocalized. So here we have a, a, a curve, a scaling curve. And we want to know if there is a phase transition in between, between delocalized photons and localized photons. I remind you, so is there a localization phase transition? I remind you, no, I remind you, so you remember uh, uh, earlier, this uh, Anderson phase transition, when we plot, when we plot the equivalent of this C function, as a function of uh, L divided by, and this was just the conductance, which depends on this. If there is a phase transition, we should see something like this. We should see a singularity. Do you see a singularity here? But you don't know. Perhaps there is a singularity which is extremely weak. So we have to make theory. To, to answer the question, is there a singularity or not? So this is what we tried to do. And first thing that we did was uh, to do a microscopic QED approach, which is valid for uh, the parameter, which is valid in the limit that the number of atoms much larger than n uh, perp. So 
if you are doing uh, this Q microscopic QED approach, you get P of gamma that is given by this. Don't, we don't, I don't want to enter into those calculations. And you get that this C function looks like this. Overall, what it means is that in this localized region, this theory gives you this plot. So it is scaling, it is good. And, you, and this function has absolutely no singularity. You see it here. This function has no singularity. Okay? But it's not enough. Perhaps there is a singularity here. So then we did another uh, approach, which is called, uh, which is phenomenological, which is a, a Markov process that, uh, approach that is based on uh, small world networks. Did you hear about small world networks? So this is very interesting. Uh, you, you never heard about uh, small world networks? Really? Who never heard about this? I, I claim that it's not true. So you, uh, there is, uh, so it, it was very popular in the 1960s. The question is the following. Uh, <clears throat> how I can phrase it? Uh, what is your distance between each of you, so most of you are Brazilian, I guess. So it is only for Brazilian people, let's say. Okay? What is the distance in terms of acquaintances between you and the president of the state, Lula? How many people that you know that, uh, that you know in order to arrive to him? What, how much is it in Brazil? So in the United States, it is four. In Israel, which is a much more connected country, it is two. I guess in, in Brazil, it may be, I don't know. But I don't know, I don't know the, this. But you, you know this, uh, this uh, history of, so this is a small world network. This is the origin of small world networks. What is the minimum number of acquaintances that you need to know somebody? So we use this theory. Uh, of, uh, I mean, a uh, more elaborate version of small world networks uh, to describe this uh, problem. And what we found is uh, this Markov process gives this plot. All the details you can find in the paper with uh, Robin Kaiser and uh, Ari Gero. Okay? So this is the plot, okay? And you see that it fits very well, this scaling, all along. But the problem is that this plot does not have any singularity. So this theory, this small world network theory, does not have a phase transition. So which means that there is only a crossover between delocalized and localized photons. There is no phase transition. Okay? So uh, it means that uh, we don't know perhaps why they are localized and delocalized, uh, delocalized, sorry, and localized photons. But what is sure is that it's not because of Anderson. Because Anderson would give in three dimensions a phase transition. <clears throat> okay, so there, there are good reasons that this is due to uh, subradiance, cooperative effects. Okay, no phase transition. <clears throat> uh, so now, half an hour, yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Another feature of uh, Anderson phase transition, if you remember, is the fact that it depends on the space dimensionality. That we observe this transition in three dimensions, but in two and one dimension, it does not exist. Remember? So here, what the second thing that we did, in addition to that, was to look at the uh, dependence upon space dimensionality. Is there a difference between uh, dealing with the uh, eigenvalues of the imaginary part of the interaction and the, real the part? imaginary part of the, the whole ham effective Hamptonian? This is an excellent question. I will answer to this uh, after this. OK, I'll remind you. No, don't worry. This is the <laughs> part of my talk. Okay. <laughs> this is a very important part of the talk. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, so now, uh, uh, as you just reminded us, I, I remind you that we are looking at the distribution of the imaginary part of, uh, of this matrix, which means the uh, escape rate 
the width of the excited level. So uh, what is the uh, dependence upon dimension? So in one dimension, uh, what you have to do, you have exactly the same problem, but you have to replace this matrix by now this matrix, cosine K0 Rij. And, uh, okay, good, this is what we have to do. Uh, so now the, the point is that I remind you that in three dimensions, what we found, we found that there is a crossover between uh, a gas of independent atoms that uh, uh, just uh, emit their photons independently and a strong cooperative emission where the uh, photon does not go out. So I want to see what if I observe this in one dimension. So in one dimension, I have uh, this gamma ij, and I'm interested in the two limits, the limits of a di uh, dilute large sample gas, wigner weisskopf plus disorder effect, and the decay limit, where the volume is very small compared to the wavelengths, and this matrix is given just by this. Okay, you take r equal to zero. So r equal to zero here, which means that this matrix is just made out of ones. And in that case, P of gamma is given by the sum of two delta functions. Okay, so uh, in that case, you can solve exactly the problem, but I see that uh, you are perhaps a little bit uh, tired, no? You want to see the solution of this? Yeah, you want, but uh, you are not so sure. Uh, but it's a, it's a mistake because it's really a beautiful exact solution. There are not so many, so I will uh, just uh, skip this. But just to show you that in that case, in one dimension, do not uh, obtain uh, the wigner weisskopf limit of uh, atoms that emit uh, independently their atoms, their uh, photons, sorry. So we get instead something strange that you didn't want to, to hear what it is about, but this is this. But what is important is that there is no single atom limit, which means that in one dimension, uh, it is absolutely clear that all the emission of the photons is driven by cooperative effects. There is absolutely no effect of disorder. Disorder does not play a role. So which means that this rules out Anderson as a mechanism for uh, cooperative emission. It is just due to decay. So this is the bottom line of what is written here. So then we can, so this is what is written. D equals one, no crossover between localized and delocalized photons. Single atom limit is never reached. And the results in D equals one are valid both for ordered and disordered media. There is no random variable. So which means that cooperative effect, and not disorder, is the mechanism underlying photon localization in D equals to one. Disorder doesn't play a role. And this is an exact solution, okay? Now 2D. 2D, uh, you have to replace this matrix that we studied for the 3D case by this matrix where J0 is the uh, Bessel function. And again, we cannot do the trick that was beautiful, but I didn't uh, tell you more about this for 1D. But there is another trick, which is, uh, okay, which also I will not uh, enter into. But overall, we can calculate exactly the P of gamma distribution, and we see that there is absolutely no phase transition. So no phase transition in 2D as well, which means that uh, in 2D, the, the emission is uh, driven by cooperative effects also. So uh, <coughs> then there is, uh, there is no phase transition for this uh, uh, gamma ij for the spontaneous emission rates. And uh, here what we did was to study the time evolution of the ground state population driven by the eigenvalues of the random matrix gamma ij. Now I come to your question. So your question is, was this one? Tell me if it's true. This is the Hamiltonian that we studied, okay? And this, in this Hamiltonian, this Vij describes the interaction between 
atoms due to disorder and uh, cooperative emission. This interaction has two parts, a real part and imaginary part. This imaginary part drives the spontaneous, emi spontaneous emission rate. But now, your question is, what about this one? Perhaps instead of looking just at this, you should look at this, or perhaps better, you should look at VIJ. Is it your question? Uh, this is a very good question. So we asked ourselves this question, and we tried to solve it. So uh, we studied the Copenhagen We studied the Copenhagen of this Hamiltonian. So those are the complex eigenvalues. And uh, so this Hamiltonian has eigenvalues of, uh, of that sort, okay? And so they are uh, uh, complex valued because the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian. And we call them, we can write them always under that form by definition. And then we have to study gamma n, lambda n, sorry, and lambda n is complex valued, okay? So uh, if you do it for two atoms, then we know that there is an exact solution. So here it's just uh, uh, numerics of this. This is the real part of uh, lambda. This is the imaginary part of it. And in fact, there are uh, two cooperative states, superradiant and uh, subradiant. We solved it exactly at the very beginning of this talk. Okay, so those are numerically, those are those two states, here and here, okay? And this is exact for two atoms, for n equals two. If you want to go to n atoms and n large, this is the numerics, it's much more complicated, okay? But what is interesting is that you can, uh, uh, you can notice here that you have those uh, states which are cooperative states, which are the equivalent of those cooperative pairs. But now they are cooperative states of n atoms. And they are here, here, here. So this is numerics. And what we did here was the following. Is it possible now to look for a criterion for a localization transition if there is, for this quantity? So uh, at that point, we have to, uh, to define another uh, localization criterion. criterion. So you remember that uh, the last two days, we defined a localization criterion. You remember what it was? Which criterion uh, we used to see if there is localization or not? What was the quantity that was very important? It was the, what we call the conductance, G. Okay, so G uh, at the transition. So th this is what I plotted here. Okay, so this is the scaling uh, quantity, G. Okay. And now I want to uh, define this G uh, in another way, which is uh, also very old. It is due to uh, Taoles, you see, in 1972-1977. And in fact, this was uh, adapted to uh, whatever quant open quantum systems uh, using random matrix theory by uh, Italo Guarnieri in 1994, and by Gilles Montambo and myself in 1992. <laughs> so uh, this is ex an extremely general criterion, which is equivalent to the conductance, but is more general. So how does it work? So uh, <clears throat> I need two hands to... This, no. this random system, this is the random system. It is in a finite volume, finite size, and this is the uh, uh, energies of this random system, okay? So now I take a, another random system, which is this one, okay? And I want to put them 
uh, one in contact with the other. Now, if it happens that for each energy level here, you will find another energy level that is as close as possible in energy, then when we will put together those two systems, you will have a, a, an energy level that corresponds to wave function that is delocalized not on L, but on 2L. You agree with this? You understand what I mean? Say it again. To say it again. Yes? Only for you. I have two quantum systems with different spectra. Okay? So I want now to see under which condition a given energy level is corresponds to a wave function that is spatially delocalized. So one condition for this is that when I put the two systems together, this one and this one, at this energy, the wave function will be delocalized over the two entities. In order to do this, I need that for a given energy, I will, I will find another energy that is as close as possible to this. Because if they are like this, then there will not be a, a delocalized wave function. So then the idea is, to find a way uh, to see if for a given state here, there is another state that is as close as possible here. So now one point is that each, uh, because systems are of finite size, they have width, and I call this width uh, gamma. This delta E is just the difference, to, uh, uh, which is a random variable, between uh, neighboring next nearest uh, uh, levels, okay? And now I define this quantity, which is the width of the levels, average over uh, the distribution of the levels, divided by the width, or the distance, sorry, between levels, average over all the distribution of levels. So if this parameter is large, which means that the width is much larger than this, then I know that I will, I will have a large overlap and I will have delocalized states and therefore I will have a conductor. If this parameter is small compared to one, it means that the uh, distance in energy between neighboring level, levels will be much uh, larger than the width of the levels and therefore I will have a small overlap and I will have localized states and I will have an insulator. You like this? So this parameter, G, is defined by this. It is called the Taules parameter. And the point is that for you can show uh, that this parameter is exactly equivalent to the electrical conductance. This is, not, this is why it is called G. It's the conductance. It is nice. Okay? So this was uh, the discovery of uh, Taules. And here what we want to do is to use this criterion with, uh, with this uh, spectrum. Okay? So this is what we did. And uh, okay, so this is the Taules parameter. It describes localization phase transition. You remember that uh, yesterday I told you that this G of L should fulfill this uh, scaling uh, behavior. You remember? And in fact, I told you that to show that this scaling behavior, which means that this is a function not of two variables, the uh, size of the system and the disorder, but just one variable, this is difficult to show. In fact, you can show it using this Taules criterion. Okay? Uh, and if you remember, I said yesterday that uh, assuming this scaling form is the same as saying that this logarithmic derivative of this G is a function of G only. Remember? Yes? You don't say yes to please me. You really remember. Yes? So uh, this G, this is what I showed yesterday and again today. In this, this is the Taules parameter, in fact. And you see that this is a scaling parameter. And in three dimensions, it has this Anderson phase transition. So now the question, is it possible to use this Taules scaling parameter uh, for this uh, spectrum that we uh, obtained. And the answer is that you cannot really use this one 
because in this definition of the tallest parameter, uh, the average over all configurations of gamma is constrained by something which is just stupid. Uh, it's just a mathematical constraint. So in order to go around this, we define instead something that looks very much like this, which is defined by that. So here, uh, uh, average over i means average over the distribution of atoms, which means average over the spectrum here. And this average here is over this order. Okay, so there are two different averages. And when you calculate now this tallest parameter, defined that way for this spectrum, this is what you obtain for scalar waves. So first of all, it obeys scaling. This is the moment that you should say, wow, it's great. It's scaling. You found scaling. So first of all, we found scaling. Then, second thing, look at this. You remember that uh, beta of g was defined as the logarithmic derivative of g with respect to l. And this is this, uh, the fact that there is scaling means that this function depends only on g. Now, if this function uh, vanishes, it means that g is independent of l. And if g is independent of l, this means this is the definition of a transition point, a phase transition. It means that you have a given quantity that is independent of the scaling with the So here, if you look at this, at this plot, you see that obviously there is scaling, so this is for very different uh, disorders. But you see that here G is a decreasing function of L, of L, decreasing, 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 less decreasing, less decreasing, and suddenly here it is increasing. This means that beta of G, which is the, this derivative, must vanish at some point. This means that there is a phase transition. So finally, we found a phase transition in this problem. We were so happy. So we found the phase transition. Here it is. There is a function beta of g, and this function vanishes at some point. And when you look at the scaling, there is good scaling, and you see that there is a point here, which is g uh, of the order of 1, at which there is a critical disorder at which uh, this uh, beta vanishes, so where, is, where we have this uh, phase transition point. We were extremely happy. We saw Anderson phase transition in a given system, which means that Anderson is much better than Dicke. Okay? Because we studied the, another quantity, which is the spectrum of the, the, of the uh, non-emission energies, and not only the uh, emission rates. So this answered your question. OK, good. So we were extremely, extremely happy. And we were so happy that we were not uh, happy alone. There is another uh, group of Sergei Skipetrov and Sokolov that, from a completely different approach, found exactly the same results. So everybody was happy. We celebrated. And then this was obtained for scalar waves. Then we turn, so we have a phase transition, but which phase transition? What is the universality class? Is it Anderson localization? We didn't care too much because we found a transition. But then we move to the vector case, not the scalar waves, but the vector waves, which, is, which are the real electromagnetic waves, right? And in that case, you have scaling, but this is what you obtain, which means that uh, G is an increasing function of L, but it's always an increasing function of L, which means that beta of G never vanishes. There is no phase transition for polarized waves. Then we are very unhappy because uh, this is a more physical uh, case. But the question remains, so this is again the vectorial case. This is the scalar case, so you see the difference. You see that here it must vanish. Here it will never vanish. And again, you look it, you look there is no scaling uh, that uh, gives a transition point. And this is beta of G, 
it vanishes here. Here it never vanishes. This is zero. And this was uh, uh, the conclusion. There is no phase transition for polarized waves. Uh, so, but it's not so sad because, uh, first of all, we don't understand why there is a phase transition. So we saw it, but there is a phase transition. But what is really the driving of this phase transition? Is it only disorder or cooperative effect? It's a different type of phase transition. It's not Anderson. And it depends very much on, uh, on the nature of the waves. So for instance, I told you that uh, under, the Anderson localization transition is valid for electrons, for electromagnetic waves, for sound waves, for phonons, for whatever. This transition is valid only for this specific case of uh, scalar waves. So this is the summary. <coughs> uh, we studied the uh, scaling properties of this non-Hermitian Euclidean random Hamiltonian, where this interaction term is non-Hermitian, is a complex valued. We found that this Hamiltonian accounts for cooperative properties of the atomic gas, super and sub radiance. It also depends on the disorder. The radiation pattern is well accounted by the imaginary part of this interacting potential. And the distribution of eigenvalues of gamma ij exhibits scaling, but there is no indication of the existence of a phase transition driven either by disorder or by cooperative interactions. Uh, the interplay between disorder and cooperative effect depend upon the space dimensionality. For two or three dimensions, we saw that there is a crossover between a delocalized wigner weisskopf regime, where all the atoms emit independently their uh, uh, photons, and the behavior that is driven by cooperative effects, eventually the Dicke regime. For D equals to one, there is no single atom limit, so which means that there is no wigner weisskopf limit. And the eigenvalue distribution of the whole Hamiltonian HE exhibits scaling properties, but moreover, it has a critical behavior for scalar waves only. And this can be obtained using the uh, uh, parameter that looks very much like the Taules parameter. The critical behavior disappears for vector waves, and the nature and universality of this transition is still unclear. And there are, in fact, new experimental efforts that are trying to probe uh, the interplay between disorder and cooperative effects. They are mostly experimentalists working uh, here, which means not me. Uh, and uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, Robin is one of them. And like this, I will uh, thank you with a few minutes before the end. Now you want to hear about Casimir effect? Uh, thank you for, uh, for the nice talk. And uh, okay, as an experimentalist, I always get uh, tremendously curious to find out how to make the uh, set, uh, that work on the on the tabletop. So, what's the idea? Take a mod, cool it down, and uh, see the fluorescence out of it uh, with a pump, or how it would it be implemented? Huh? How to do this to implement exactly. this experimentally? So, uh, uh, <coughs> for instance, uh, uh, subradiance for uh, cold atomic gases has been observed by uh, Robin Kaiser uh, a few years ago. And, but what was observed was the distribution of uh, uh, emission rates of photons. So this is simple to do. You do simply uh, photon detection from uh, the gas. You excite one or few atoms, and you look at the photons that are escape your uh, system. So it's fluorescence. 
in order to observe this transition with the complete non-emission spectrum, this I don't know how to do this. I think it's, oh, I don't know, I have no idea how to do this. Uh, really tired. For most of the talk, you you are using the scalar approximation, right? Yes. Uh, is there any model that could do that? We could. This will be a good approximation. The scalar waves. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no, it's uh, well. It's a simple. Mo I mean, there are things that are independent of this, which means that you you know you can always average over the the polarization and all. Uh, for instance, the escape rates uh, distribution, the distribution of escape rates, escape rates of photons uh, for both uh, vector waves or scalar waves, you will obtain the same behavior. So I showed it for the scalar waves, but for the vector waves, it's exactly the same. For that case, there is an essential difference. And uh, so first of all, okay, the vector waves are the real waves. But what is interesting here is to understand why there is a difference between the two. How come? What in the polarization makes it that you observe, uh, you don't observe the phase transition? Uh, this is something that we don't know. If it is possible to observe the scalar case or not, in fact, there were, there were an idea by uh, Georg Maret uh, when we presented this. Um, to use a specific case of uh, semiconducting powders, in which case you could, you have scalar waves. But uh, it's very difficult to achieve it. Well, uh, in theory, you could uh, engineer a system to try to implement this, right? Sorry? We could try to engineer a system, a physical system, to try to observe scalar waves and implement Yes, yes. Yeah, but uh, you know, I gave an example, but uh, <laughs> unsuccessful you. for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the talk. Uh, I was looking at some of those graphs and it reminded me, and this subradiance effect reminded me of the experiments with uh, slow light and stopped light. And uh, have you ever seen something related to this? Because I was thinking there are a lot of applications to this. Uh, and it seems to me that if you could uh, get something out of controlling disorder on your system to control subradiance, would maybe uh, make better uh, ways to retain light in a, in a medium, right? Uh, okay, so uh, let's try to deconstruct your question. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, to understand the exact uh, uh, weight between cooperative effect and disorder, it's all the, the point was to, to see that it's very difficult. We don't know what comes from disorder and what comes from cooperative effects. They are very much intricate. So this is one thing. The second thing is that uh, you mentioned slow light. So slow light is a, is a way to, to control the, the effect of disorder. In, in, this, uh, in this setup. So if it is possible to use slow light in order to, to de deconvoluate what I did, yes, it is possible. We tried to do it uh, many years ago with uh, Lynn Howe at uh, Harvard. She was one of the, and so she knew about slow light, not like me, but uh, we did not succeed. So we had the, uh, three years grant to work on this, wasted money. <laughs> yeah, it's just that uh, some of those graphs reminded me of the Kramer's-Kronig's relations, 
And uh, you know, premise chronic relations are somewhat, uh, what do you call it, Phenomen phenomenological, right? You, no. Right? Oh, no, they're not. Oh, okay. Kramer's chronic, they're not phenomenological. Oh, okay. They're expression of causality. Causality ah, okay. is here <laughs> to stay. <laughs> okay, so I have to do my homework first. So. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but, it's, but I found that it, it seemed to me to be very, very related to uh, what we're talking about here, right? Mm. I'm not so sure, but uh, this we can uh, discuss. You have to precise uh, what you mean by this. Okay, okay. Uh, but here we don't have problem of co any problem of causality and uh, things like this. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Uh, so you're saying the distribution of the statistics of the escape rate for scalar and vectorial is more or less the same, uh, but if you look at the full matrix, you, in one case you get a transition, in the other not. Yes. Is, is the conclusion that the photon escape rate is not a proper signature? Yes, this is the conclusion, absolutely. It's a very interesting quantity. It's beautiful, it shows the scaling, whatever, mm -hmm. but if you want to answer the question, is there a phase transition, this is not the right quantity to look at. So which means that you can have uh, photons that are trapped into your system. You can call them localized photons. This depends on this order, but this is not the right quantity to look at. But then, do you claim that the statistic of the gamma IJ that you computed reflects the photon escape rate? Yes. Okay. In a very specific situation. So, yeah, you, you could ask, suppose that you excite more than one atom, then it's something different, which is true. No, no, still a single excitation. Uh, so for me, if you diagonalize the full matrix, you will get uh, some eigen complex eigenvalues. Yes. The real part will be the, the escape rates or imaginary, depends on your convention. Yes. And this will be the true escape rates. Yes, if you look at, yeah. But the eigenvalues of the, f the real part of the eigenvalues of the full matrix is not like the eigenvalues of the real part of the matrix. You're absolutely right. This, uh, I agree so completely this with this. This is why I don't know if this statistic of the gamma IJ uh, reflect the escape rate uh, of the photons. Okay, so first of all, you see that for uh, two atoms, this works like that. Yeah, but the matrices commute for n equal to two. Yes, this Real is true. Real and imaginary. <coughs> yes, so. this is this is absolutely true. Uh, but the point is that if you if you are in this uh, limit of one uh, atom in the excited state, you can show that the uh, the detection function, which means what will go out, is just the imaginary part of this VIJ, which means the gamma IJ. Only this. Okay, but uh, <laughs> but but again, this is not uh, this is not the right function to look at. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a nice yeah. function, but it's not the right one. Mm -hmm. okay. But it has also the interest to see to show that uh, uh, as a function of the space dimensionality, uh, it is it does not depend really on the disorder. It is driven just by cooperative effects. What I showed in one, in d equals one and two is that disorder, in fact, does not play any role. It's purely uh, a cooperative effect. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, hello, Professor. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I have a question about the, in the Markov approach. And uh, when, he, when uh, you talk about the Markov approach, if there is like a Markov chains, and we can think like Markov chains of emission in the system, and basically you have like this uh, random emission in the system, and, and it becomes like a destruction in the, uh, in the system, and the, it, it's, it's due the, to the Markov chains, of course. Uh, okay, I'm not sure that I understand uh, well the question. This Markov uh, process was a very special Markov process. It was a small world network. So small world network means that the following. Uh, so you remember this, uh, what I, I told is the interaction. <coughs> the idea is that uh, you consider, for instance, take a simple system, 
like this one, you take n atoms on a ring. Okay, there are n atoms, n sites. Okay, and now each site can interact only with nearest neighbors. It can be uh, random or not random. Okay. okay. But it is short range interaction. So you, kn you know how to solve this problem exactly. But now suppose that you add randomly uh, with uh, just extremely, extremely small rate possibility of long range interactions between, for instance, this site and these sites. It's, it's not. Okay, okay. So this. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a small world network Markov process. That in fact, your system, your uh, atoms, they interact only nearest neighbors, but with a vanishingly small probability, they can have a very long range interaction. Okay. And this is enough, so this is a Markov process, but this is enough to just create this, uh, this interaction that we were talking about. And this is the model that we use to uh, to solve the gamma IJ distribution that I showed before. Okay, that, that's like uh, you have an average ratio between the interactions, and you have like this exponential uh, decay between them, but if you sum all the contributions, it's basically vanish. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. More questions? Coffee time? Coffee time. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, Professor Ackerman. So this was the last. So we meet in 23 minutes at 11 o'clock here for the next lecture of uh, Marcelo Martinelli. Thank you. <laughs>